Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-rijalun qawamun ala nisa. That most of us, we translate this as that men are the maintainers and protectors of women. But when we look at the root of the word qawamun, from, from qawm, if I said to you qawm, what would you do? What would you do? You would stand up. Right? You would stand up. And then it says in this next one, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given one, he has given one more than the other. But he actually doesn't specify which one he gave more than the other. So let's go back and look at it. It this says, and when I say, الرِّجَالٌ قَوَامٌ عَلَى nisa, It says that men actually, they stand up for women. Now, that being one of it, of course, how, do he, how is he going to stand up? He has a responsibility to protect her. He has a responsibility, he has a responsibility to maintain her and make sure that she's well taken care of. Well, then when it says one has more than the other, which, which one? How is this working? Why is he responsible for the protection and the maintenance? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he was developing, when a baby girl was developing her womb, he was developing muscular structure. So therefore, his muscular muscular structure in his body has the responsibility to stand up and protect women and to use his strength to maintain her. But subhanAllah, what does she have that's worthy of protection? What does she have that he must maintain her? This is really the key. See, when we go back to the other hadith, and this is the beauty of this deen, is that our deen is not one hadith base that I can just spout something from. When we go back to, when we tie these ayat to the Prophet Sallallahu when he says the womb of the woman is connected to the arsh of Allah, to the throne of Allah, what is the arsh? What is the throne? It is the seat of majesty. It is the seat of the unseen, that when the unseen then is commanded and descends into the earth. So when a woman is pregnant, we, no one knows actually when that exact moment occurs. No one knows exactly what she's carrying. No one knows if she's carrying the next, no one knows if she's carrying the next revolutionary or the next best doctor or the next best educator or the best professor. No one knows what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what mercy or what power or what gift or what secret or what opener or what change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to send into the earth in that woman. So subhanAllah, even when she finds out and they're so excited she's pregnant, still what's in her womb is a matter of the unseen. At 120 days, an angel comes and descends and he writes their four aspects of what this child's qadr is going to be. What is going to be the decree of this child? And he writes that, where is this child? This child is in the womb of the woman. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you that inside the body of this woman, inside the spirituality of this woman, heaven and earth meet. And so with that, the man has a responsibility to make sure that she's, that she's protected, to make sure that that, that that which is happening inside of her womb will manifest with the best light, to make sure that it manifests with the best possibilities, the best hope, the best chances, the best opportunity. Because what is he protecting? He's protecting not only her, he's protecting his future. He's protecting the future of our ummah. He's protecting the future of our world. But there's something even more than that he's protecting. And it goes into that second part of the hadith where Allah says, I created this womb from my name, Ar-Rahman. And whoever connects to it has connected to me. And whoever disconnects from it is disconnected from me. This Ar-Rahman, this is mercy. 
This is the most powerful, most encompassing, most beautiful mercy that we would ever know. And in this mercy, if it is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created the womb, the womb in Arabic is called the Rahim. It is a seat, a place of mercy, so much that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allah has caused me to love three things from this dunya. I love salah, I love good smell, and I love women. I love that which takes me to Allah, by which I can commune with Allah. I love good smell because it brings the angels. Ya Rasulullah, why do you love, not tolerate, not like, not put up with, not include, but why do you love women? He said, because of their mercy. Why should that matter to you? When we live in an age where war is rampant, when we live in an age that we have lost our humanity, when we live in an age where people can literally watch others starve to death, when people can come into villages and burn them down with no sense of mercy, when people can, when, when, when police can beat down innocent people in the street and feel no shame because they feel justified because of their color or because of their race or because of their religion. When we have a, the level of lack of education, there is 63% of Muslim women in the Muslim world are illiterate. When we have a world that is filled with the kind of hatred and the kind of desperation and destitution and violence, when we will put, when we will imprison people at mass levels of incarceration, when we imprison them, when Asma Hanif would be running a women's shelter by herself for over a decade, when we have no mercy, when we're wondering, Ya Allah, when will your mercy come? Ya Rabbi, when will you grant us relief? I'm reminded of the story of the Sahabas that when they were in a battlefield and they begin to lose, they start to gather with each other and say, we have forgotten something of the Sunnah and we're not winning. And the reason Allah isn't giving us success because we have forgotten something of the Sunnah what could it be? And someone said, the miswak. The miswak. So they started to brush their teeth with the miswak. Right? And subhanAllah, the enemies ran away because they said they're, 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 they're cleaning their teeth because they're going to eat us. <laughs> right? And the enemy ran away. They didn't have to fight them again. If you want the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to descend upon this ummah, We've got to honor the sunnah of honoring the woman. For a very, very long time, we have not been honoring each other. For a very, very long time, we have been burying our girls alive, the women. What do I mean when I say burying our daughters alive? When we look at the recent Me Too campaign, and the amount of women who came out and said that they had been sexually assaulted. And the world stood like as if it were in awe. When we had statistics before that that showed one in three girls are molested before the age of 10. And their mothers know. Their mothers know. Their aunties know. The grandmas know. But because we walked around with a sense of shame, because we walked around with a sense of guilt, because we carried something saying that this is, this is, this, what did you do? What did you say? I told you not to stay too close. I told, don't tell anybody. We're gonna, we're, this is just a secret between me and you. We kept the secret that began to bury the souls of our daughters. We kept a secret that began to bury their faith. We kept secrets that disconnected them from Allah. We kept secrets that we should have burned it down for. 
We kept secrets that we should have said, I will stand up and you will never do this to my children. And when our other sisters and daughters and nieces came forward and said, me too, we said, I, I don't believe you. That's, come on, what were you doing? Where were you? Did you flirt with him? We didn't believe them. For years, we have, I, I have a secret to tell the fathers, it's horrible. For years, we've been saying to girls, you know, even, even like you, you have your friends, but really they're so cliquish and they're so dramatic and they have so much jealousy and, and cattiness. Like, you know, we have girls who said, I'd rather just be friends with boys because they're less drama. We didn't recognize their value and we didn't tell them. We didn't honor them as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored them. We didn't teach them that they were valid and they were okay and they were worth a whole lot more than this world could ever amass. We didn't teach them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored them from the beginning. I, I, I want to remind us that we have to change that. January 20th of last year, they had the National Women's March and I had the blessed pleasure of being invited by our sister Linda Sarsour and got to address 500,000 people. It's amazing. Honestly, to see that many women come together and say, I'm tired, I'm sick of it. Today is the last day. To see that many women say, I will not allow the, the highest person in this nation to assault women and just walk away with it and get away with it, even if everyone else will. I won't. <laughs> that I will stand against our vulnerabilities. And subhanAllah, I remember walk with my son that day. I was standing next to my son. I had him with me. And subhanAllah, as women were chanting, our bodies, our choice, our bodies, our choice. He looked at me because he knows his mama is no feminist. So he looked at me and I said, SubhanAllah, I want him to understand though the significance of this as it relates to molestation and rape and assault against women. Yes, our bodies, our choice. But then I said, you know what? I want him to recognize also my, I want to recognize the Muslim women who are choosing to stand up and who are choosing to wear hijab in the face of Islamophobia, who are choosing to wear hijab in the face of great threat. I wanted him to understand this is my head, my choice, my body, my choice. That this is the God-given right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me. And so as my son and I began to stand in that march and say, and just and stand with what was right, I begin to notice, where are my Muslim brothers? Where are the rijalun qawamu lana nisa? Where are the men who stand up for women? When women are saying, listen, I have been violated, that there are wrongs and atrocities done against me. And I'm not just talking about sexually, I'm talking about the illiteracy rate. I'm talking about that when a girl is 12 years old, she, her shoulders begin to sink in and she literally begins to hide herself because she doesn't believe that she's strong. She doesn't believe that she's valuable. I need the fathers to spend time with their daughters and say, I honor you, I love you, you're important. As our sister Salma reminded us about Fatima Zahra, I want them to implement the sunnah when they walk in the room and they're with a group of men talking, you know, important matters. I want when their daughter to walk in the room for you to kiss her hand and sit her in your place. Why? Because I want her to know that her place is in, the, in, the, in important matters. My time is up and be idnillah, I'm going to do my best to close this out. We will honor women. Not just when, alhamdulillah, RIS, mashallah. This is like, alhamdulillah, wa shukurillah. This is a gem, this is a jewel. 
But the, as we see women leadership in their fields, mashallah, women scholars and thinkers and speakers standing up, I want us to take this back home to our masajid. I want us to take this home back to our communities. Because I'll tell you something, that as Dr. Sherman Jackson mentioned yesterday, that our women and our children are afraid of their own religion. And I'll tell you why, because they don't see themselves. They don't, they don't, it, it, what happens is, is that when we go to our masajid and we don't see women who are teachers, and I'm not asking for the women to be the imam. I, I'm not asking for that. Let's not get it twisted. But I am asking that she should be on the board. She should be on the planning committee. That when we're building masajid, she should be the first thought, not the afterthought. I'm saying that when we're building our institutions, she must be at least 50% at the table or more because she's majority of the population. As our children are watching, trust me, they're saying, these young men are saying that if the woman has no voice in Beto Law, then she will have no voice in Beto Nah. Right? If the woman doesn't have a voice in the house of Allah, then we feel like she has, she has no right to have no voice in my house. But I bring you back to the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was the yaqeen, it was the tawakkul, it was the, it was the strength of character of Hajar radiallahu ta'ala anha. It was her strength that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built the holiest city of Mecca around her. And we go there to the Kaaba, she's there. We cannot complete Hajj unless we walk in the footsteps of Hajar. So those of who are thinking, well, I don't know, because women, they weren't prophets, right? They weren't prophets, so what's their rank? There were 124,000 prophets in a Sahih Hadith, but how many women are there with a womb connected to the throne of Allah? And when we look at that example, look at the Prophet You can't complete the rites of Hajj Yes, you walk in the footsteps of unless you walk in the footsteps of prophets. Yes, you will do what they did, but it won't be complete unless you make sa'i. It won't be complete unless you walk in the footsteps of Hajar. I'm telling us, our relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala won't be complete until we honor women as they should be honored.